I appreciate your help in singing these invitation songs as we consider the invitation of Jesus, come to me. And yes, oh, why not tonight? Well, this morning, tonight means now. We find that Jesus, he gave several invitations in the sense of come during his life and even after his life. In this particular instance, John 21, this is after his resurrection. And he says to his disciples, come. And this was an invitation to breakfast. But we would find other places. For instance, Mark 1, 17. As Jesus was calling his disciples, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And then in Mark 10, verse 21, there he said to a young man, come follow me. But if you would recall this context, it was the rich young ruler. And he says to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, that you may have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. The sad thing in this story is he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. His possessions now for him were greater than all that Jesus had promised him. And then there's that final invitation that you read in Revelation 22. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So here we see invitations to come. But the one that's most memorable to most of us is that from the scripture reading. Matthew 11, beginning in verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. As we consider this invitation of Jesus today, I want us to look at these four things. I need to come. I can come. And Jesus told me how to come. And then, will you come? First of all, I need to come. Many of you remember Kirk Cameron of Growing Pains, a popular show maybe as much as 20 years ago. Well, he has become a popular religious speaker, speaking in marriage seminars and also teaching on evangelism. Now, I would say at the outset, I cannot endorse everything that he says. But it's interesting how he uh, teaches about evangelism in trying to get a person to think about their own soul. He asked some questions. And one of the things he would first say is, would you consider yourself to be a good person? Most of the people would tend to say, well, yes. And then he says, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? And then that's followed by asking specifically, if a person has broken the commandments with questions like, have you ever told a lie? And you see, most people would recognize, well, no, I have not lived the Ten Commandments perfectly. And then he asked the question, if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, will you be innocent or guilty? And then he has that follow-up question, a pointed question, would you go to heaven or hell. Now, I'm not necessarily saying these are all the best questions to ask or that they might even imply some things that, well, may not be the best things to imply. But he's getting to the heart of, I need to come. See, I'm not good enough. We find, if we would ask the question, have any of us lived God's commandments perfectly? We know we've fallen short. 
And if we're not willing to acknowledge we've fallen short, take God's word for it. Look at Romans 3, beginning in verse 10, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. This is a wholesale indictment of mankind. Do you consider yourself a good person? Most people would answer, yes. But in God's eyes, are we so good? None is righteous. No, not one. You see, I need to come. When Jesus said, come unto me, I need to come. Number two, I can come. Some of you are familiar with this, some not. This is Calvinism, which is at the heart of many religious groups and teachings today even after several hundred years. It can kind of be characterized by this tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And I can tell you that, no, the subject of this lesson is not Calvinism, and we don't have time to discuss every one of these planks of Calvinism. But I would suggest to you that the ultimate teaching of Calvinism is I don't have choice. I can't really come. Total depravity is the idea that we are all born guilty of Adam's sin, unconditional election. In other words, if God's decided you're to be saved, uh, no, no conditions, nothing you're to do, either you're saved or you're lost, God's already determined that. Limited atonement. Instead of us singing, Gospel being for all. With limited atonement, you see, it's not really for all. Only the ones God's chosen. Irresistible grace. If he's chosen you, you, you can't say no. But sadly, if you've not been chosen, you can't say yes. Perseverance of the saints, kind of once saved, always saved. That, that's it in a nutshell. To see some statements about this, well, in total hereditary depravity, John MacArthur teaches this. He says, the depravity of the sinner, which renders it, look at this, impossible for him to respond to the gospel. Now, I want you to see this. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor. Yeah, John MacArthur is saying it's impossible for some to respond to the gospel. All of them are unable to seek God, John MacArthur says. Calvinists tell us that man has no free will with regarding salvation and can only be saved if God elects him to salvation. But yet I see Jesus saying, Come unto me, all. You who labor are heavy laden. I can come. God gives me choice. I can choose to come. I can choose not to come. And we find this again and again with the scripture taught. You remember back in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and Eve, and God gives the command to the man, you shall surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So he's given the command, don't eat of this one tree. And then as you get to Genesis 3, verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree, talking about this forbidden tree, was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
And then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. God had said, don't do it. They did it. They made the choice. God gave them choice. You get to Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. And I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving your Lord, your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. Here he lets them know, you can choose. You can choose life or death. As you get over to Proverbs 1, verse 28, he says, Then will they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Why is God refusing them? Verse 29, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So very clearly, once again, God has given man the power of choice. So it was that, in this a more familiar passage to you, that Joshua says in Joshua 24, verse 15, Choose this day whom you will serve. I can choose, you can choose. God gave us the power of choice. And so when he says, come unto me, I can come. I can also refuse to come. But I would also suggest this. Why would any man with sound mind, understanding what Jesus promises, and the offering he's making to man, why would a man refuse to come? Makes no logical, reasonable sense. But yet you know men do. But God gives the choice. I recognize I need to come. I also acknowledge I can come. He's given me that choice. But we would also acknowledge Jesus told me how to come. Jesus told his disciples to go. And in that process, he told us how to come. You find the Great Commission in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the Gospels. In Matthew, you find it in verse 19 of chapter 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's the marching orders. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so here is the response of man to hearing the gospel. They're to be baptized. Then we find in Mark's account, chapter 16, beginning in verse 15, and he said to them, Go ye into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So once again, he gives them the marching orders, go, and he tells them what is to be preached, the gospel. We would understand the facts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That is what is to be preached. But with this, the facts of the gospel to be preached, also the commands of the gospel are to be preached. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so as I find in Matthew, he says, go baptizing. And then here in Mark, we find that you go preach the gospel and the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. Well, then as we go to Luke's account, in Luke chapter 24, verse 17, here you find that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name among all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So here we would find there's the preaching that's to take place, and he's to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now, if I were to take Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, I find that there's a response of man, that Jesus is telling me how to come. 
And he's telling me that I must believe, that I must repent, and that I must be baptized. But now as we would say, well, what was preached and what did men do? The first time that the gospel in its fullness was preached was on that day of Pentecost. We find in Acts chapter 2 verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now up to this point he had been preaching Jesus. And he proves Jesus to be the resurrected Lord. And now he makes this final proclamation. Know for certain, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I would suggest to you that when he said know for certain, surely that they would have strong conviction, believe that Jesus is the Christ. In essence... He's preaching what we found in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth, know for certain. Well, an interesting thing happens. They are contemplative and they realize we're guilty like he said. Now when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They recognize that their sinful condition, having crucified the Lord of glory, meant something had to change about their lives. Now this what shall we do? You find similar expressions in Acts 9, 6 and Acts 16, verse 30. It is legitimate and right to ask, what must I do? And if somebody were to say there's nothing you have to do, they're not answering like Peter. Because Peter gave an answer. What must they do? They've already been told, in essence, to believe, but there's something more. They're told in verse 38, repent. Repent. By the way, we find in Luke 24, 47, that repentance was to be preached. If we were to say, what is repentance? That word means, literally means, a change of mind. In other words, something about us is to change, and it starts right here in the mind, in our hearts. So he's told them to know assuredly or to believe. He's told them to repent. And then we see that he says, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so here he said, you be baptized. And this, my friends, wasn't this what Jesus was said to be preached? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Here you find in Acts chapter 2, the first time the gospel was preached, that those same conditions that Jesus enumerated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke were preached. And these are the same things that need to be preached today. And if Jesus tarries until that very day he returns, this is what needs to be preached that Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, resurrected, and that if we're to obey Him, we must believe, repent of our sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. You see, Jesus has told me how to come. And so then we'll ask that final question. Will you come? A song, and as I was preparing this, I really, in the paperless hymnal, couldn't find the song. But it's, will you come, will you come with your poor broken heart, burdened and sin oppressed, lay it down at the feet of your Savior and Lord. Jesus will give you rest. Oh, happy rest, sweet happy rest. Jesus will give you rest. I like the way it begins. Will you come? Will you come? And then it takes the ideas from this invitation of Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Will you come? We would say come to Jesus. He is the one who can deliver on his promises. There in Matthew chapter 11, both in verses 28 and 30, we see that he promised rest. He can give that rest. 
He as well promised that we could learn. Matthew 11, verse 29. And believe me, if you're going to learn, you need to be learning from Jesus. But we would also find, come to Jesus and be rewarded on the last day. In John 6, verse 37, there you read, And all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Those men who come, oh, by the way, you don't come and quit. You keep coming to him. And then there's that promise of everlasting life. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then will the king say to those on his right, you know, this great judgment scene, the left, those on the left condemn, those on the right, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It's just this way. Jesus has said to each of us, come, come unto me. And if we come unto him now and we stay with him, he's going to say come once again. And oh, how it matters on that day because that's the last day. That's the day that ushers in eternity. And to those who have come to him all of their life, he says come, inherit the kingdom, prepare for for you from the foundation of the world. Come. I need to come. Come. I can come. He gives me that choice. Come. Jesus told me how to come. With that faith, I turn from my sins. I am baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That's the instruction Jesus gave. That's the instruction that Peter preached. And so then we would ask, will you come? Now this invitation song we're going to be singing is come to Jesus. Jesus says, come unto me all ye that labor. And so now we're going to sing this song, come to Jesus. And if you... And I don't know everyone here. I don't know the circumstances of everyone's life. But if you've not been one of those who've come, turning from your sin in faith, to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, we can give you opportunity this morning to confess your faith and be baptized this morning for the forgiveness of sins. It's, if you've wandered away and need to come back, we can give you that opportunity this morning. And if there's need for prayer in some other way, we can take the time and pray for you. If you need to come, please come as we stand.